Previously on AgentPalmer.com, Palmer's trek continues with Star Trek V The Final Frontier. Eric Idle presents a sort of reminder to laugh through life, and I can confirm Nicholas is still diligently working on his novel. This is The Palmer Files, episode 107, featuring Rob Mallows, the man behind the Dayton Dossier website and blog, who is here to talk about Len Dayton, Bernard Sampson, Harry Palmer, as well as collecting books and feeding our reading habit, spy fiction, spy brary, and much, much more. Are you ready? Let's do the show! Welcome to the Palmer Files. I'm your host, Jason Sershik, also known as Agent Palmer, and on this 107th episode is Rob Mallows, the proprietor of Dayton Dossier, and in my eyes, a Len Dayton expert, as well as a collector and fan. His site, DaytonDossier.net, is one I have been visiting on and off ever since I started my Dayton journey, and now, as you'll hear, I have finished that journey, and it was high time to talk to Rob and recapture the human part of human intelligence. During the conversation you are about to hear, we discuss our respective introductions to Len Dayton's work, our book collecting and reading habits, as well as just exactly why Rob started the Dayton dossier in the first place. And well, all of that plus a whole lot more is coming your way. But first, remember, if you want to discuss this episode as you listen or afterwards, you can find all contact information for Rob and myself in the show notes. You can find more information about my guest, Rob Mallows, and of course, Len Dayton at Rob's site, DaytonDossier.net. Again, that's D-E-I-G-H-T-O-N-D-O-S-S-I-E-R.net. Don't forget, you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com. And of course, email can be sent to thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's get into it. Rob, you have a website dedicated to Len Dayton and as we are recording I have just finished reading at least on first read through the last Len Dayton book I will ever read unless he comes out with a new one Um, and I did them all in publish order and I did them all regardless of fiction or non and it was quite a journey um and it, it for me, it was happenstance. It was kind of just, I stumbled ac- across the movie, The Ipcrest File, and I went, I like this movie, but I want to know more about the source material and like, I don't know, however many novels and, you know, histories of World War II later, here I am, I've read all the man wrote. Um, but but for me, it was just happenstance. Like you, you have a website dedicated to the man, and and I, I you still write blogs about it where you collect cool first editions and stuff. Like, where did it start for you with with Len? Uh, well, first off, Jason, well done on your Odyssey, um, <laughs> because I, I I I read each of your blog posts on your the Agent Palmer website uh, for must be a good number of years now. Um, always entertaining and. It's not a, it's not, it's quite an, an undertaking you've taken because A, there are a lot of books to get through. Yeah. Uh, and B, there are so many other books you could, you could be reading as well. So, I mean, first up, I guess I should take my hat off to you. Um, and this is the first time we've spoken, but it's like, feels like it's been a long time coming, you know? Well, and um, it, I, I did read other books in between, like, and I felt like it was, it lengthened the journey, but I think it also kind yeah. of, allowed me to savor it, it yeah like there's a pacing to it where like yeah there's Absolutely. like 50 some 47 i don't know there's a lot of books right and they're actually behind me on a shelf altogether um as they probably should be but like i, I feel like like i don't know if i would have appreciated the journey had i done it in like a year and just read them all back to back to back i think you're right you can uh, like anything in life i suppose you're gonna have too much of a good thing um I mean, as you said at the start, I've been, uh, I suppose, reading and collecting and dating books for, I guess it must be about 25 years now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have read most, I've read all of them, uh, some of them more than once, but equally I can go for many years without reading one book. Uh, because like you say, it's, it's, you, 
it's the way I like it with lens books, particularly, but with other books as well. Is it's there is a pleasure uh, in going back to a book you haven't read for a long time and just rereading it. Partly because um, a, most of them are cr- cracking good stories, but also when you're familiar with the broad thrust of the story, then as a reader, um, you can just explore. T- you can savor it a little bit more, I suppose, rather than having to feel you having to consume it and sort of get through to the next chapter and stuff. So, um, yeah. Um, so um, as I say, yeah, I do take my hat off to you. It's been quite a journey, but uh, all, each of your posts have been very entertaining. And it sounds like you say, uh, um, uh, once it's like you say, when you come to the end, you, what you have an opportunity then is to look back and just to think, wow, you know, uh, it's probably very rare that um, anybody reads the whole, the oeuvre of a whole of a single author in any one go. It's probably quite rare for most readers. So. Um, you know, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the exception then because I'm not unique position. I he's suppose. not. He's not my only. Uh, he's not my only quest. I guess along this journey, like I um, yeah, and and the other authors I'm about to name are nowhere like th- there are no similarities here, right? Like so, mm-hmm. I um, I've been a fan of Chuck Klosterman since like his first uh two books, and so I'm rereading some for the sake of putting it on the blog because i like to document the journey but mm-hmm. like i i i'm five reviews but two books away from being up to date but he's still writing and publishing things and then there are um a couple other authors uh douglas copeland is another one kind of in a more of a the klosterman vein uh where i'm 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 again trying to catch up. I, I I always seem to come to the authors I like the most well after their quote unquote prime, whether they're still yeah. publishing or not. And so I'm always in catch up mode when I'm like, oh, I want, I want to read more about this. But like I I do kind of, there will come a point where I will have read all that those three authors have have written. Well, at the moment, for example, I've uh, I came late to the American author Jonathan Franson. Okay. Um, I, I think was it the corrections I read first uh, about ten years ago, and I've been uh, steadily buying copies of his books and working through those. And there, as I say, it's. I mean, I probably I, I think you you sympathise with this. I think what I I'm rather like a dog with a chew toy when I find an author I like, um, I go all in. Yeah. The other one, in the last decade or so, I've read uh, most of it. Most of his works is Umberto Eco. Okay. Um, and particularly the one I've I've now read probably four or five times is Foucault's Pendulum. Um, there's just I guess it's like any, any reader I suppose some, some with a favourite author or authors or f- style of books just something clicks you know you just feel it, like it. I've often likened uh, uh, reading lens books. Uh, it's, it's like putting it for me. It's putting on a comfortable pair of shoes. You know. Well, they're comfy. I can walk around them. I know what you know. Know what to expect, and it's just it just feels good, you know. Yeah, for for me, lens books was like putting on a, a, a like a pair of dress shoes because like sometimes you're going to a wedding and a celebration and you're really excited, but sometimes you're going to a funeral. Um, and and <laughs> and, and I only I only say that because you know while the early like Palmer stuff was great and and the Samson verse as I, I I've come to call it is fun. There, there were some quote unquote funerals in there when I was reading some of the history. The, like the nonfiction that he writes is dense, but it's still comfortable. Like it still fits. Like the the hmm. shoe still fits. It's just not as much of a celebration. And I, I, I think it's it's worth noting that that's life. Like we do go to weddings and funerals, and you 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 kind of hmm. need both. I, I think I. In reading all that Len has written, I have expanded myself because I now know more about World War II and the Battle of Britain than I, I, I never said, like, that was, ne- like, when I set out, I was like, I'll read everything he wrote. How, you know, like, hmm. sure, why not? Like, you don't think necessarily about some of the nonfiction stuff. And no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's, um, I guess, one of the, uh, as the things I find interesting about Len Dayton, the man and the author, is that he is, um, I guess it's quite a rare thing uh, these days, a sort of polymath or an autodidact. Uh, you know, he's, uh, as you said, he's written obviously novels, um, 
and history books. But of course, he's also um, uh, written cookie books. Uh, he's written, uh, he's edited Playboy's travel section. You know, he's uh, uh, he's uh, he he did the first UK first edition for On the Road. You know, lots of fascinating uh, background as a designer as well. So. Uh, he's one of these infuriatingly interesting people um, who have many, uh, well, and many strengths of their bow, but also many a sort of wealth of experiences that they obviously, I guess, bring to bear in the books uh, he writes. I suppose. Yeah, it's I. It's one of the reasons that I always try and start at the beginning with any journey. Like, and I, there were a couple blog posts that I'm sure you read that where I kind of took Len to task towards the end of the Bernard Sampson trilogies. Uh, he starts to write in the introductions that you can read these in any order. Mm-hmm. And he tries to, I, and I, you know, there's a part of me that will always want to start at the beginning on anything. And it's not until I read charity and I finished charity that I went, okay, this one could be read out of order. And and I think mm-hmm. it took reading all of them <laughs> and needing that kind of moment to reflect, to go, he might have been right about, I don't, I don't think he's right about all of them. I think some of them do work best in order. But I, I bring it up because having read the nonfiction alongside the fiction, he builds as an author in a way where, like, you kind of get, a little extra detail (laughs) from like, Mm. Oh, like he took some of the research from, I don't know, uh, you know, blood, tears and folly and really added it in as a little like, uh, you know, excerpt or, you know, historical note in for further fiction. And it, I'm still working mentally. I haven't put pen to paper as we record this. I'm still working mentally on like a, kind of a recap of my experience reading through all of it um, mm-hmm. without like, you know, going into detail on each book. And the, the only thing I can come away with right now is there are some of the one-offs that are kind of like, uh, like, like almost like a one hit wonder. Like uh, I, I think of specifically close up and goodbye Mickey mouse that do not yeah. fit in any like they don't like they're they're very one's more of a mystery compared to anything else he's ever done one's the most romantic novel i think len's ever written um in in goodbye mickey mouse and i just go like Mm -hmm. that's kind of like i i almost want to be that kind of writer where it's like i I, he can write anything yeah well i think well i'm just thinking about that uh, as you say, he's written a number of sort of one-off uh, standalone novels, but also, of course, I suppose as a as an author, he's more famous or more well known at least for the for the two series, the sort of uh, the ha- what's called the Harry Palmer series, I suppose, and then uh, as you said, the, there's ten volumes in the Bernard Sampson series. From the outside in, you know, they are in the first instance the five books, the sort of the unnamed spy series, the first books he wrote. You could get the feeling that uh, you know they were planned from the outset as a series because the character, the initial, the main character, is so well wrought, and the sort of the idea of the mise en scene in which he's placed and the, and the characters of which he's surrounded. So, yeah, yeah, they, they'd certainly warrant more than one book. But as far as I know, I don't think you know. It's interesting, also, I don't think he planned. Um, you know, uh, he wrote uh, the Ipcrest file, his first book. Uh, almost on a whim, I suppose, just when he was on a holiday in the door doing it. So uh, I don't think uh, nothing I've read about interviews and stuff with him is that it gives me any indication that he ever thought more than just, um, I, I feel, you know, it's, there's spies are hot. I'm going to write a spy story. And similarly with um, the Bernard Sampson series of which, uh, depending on who you are, it's nine or 10 in this, in the series. I know that he broadly, the, the the arc of the first three novels, Berlin Game, uh, Mexico set in London match, were planned out as a as a as a as a series, or at least a, a, an, an arc of a, of a story across three books. But uh, he has certainly hadn't planned the other two um, novels, and I guess it's quite a skill for an author to put pen to paper uh, or uh, 
start typing on the keyboard with only a sort of broad understanding of where you're going. Um, well, especially when you consider, even without spoilers, just how complicated the second two trilogy, the, the the second and third trilogies are for Bernard Sampson. Like it, it just there is, it's almost like, um, you know. I mean, faith, hope, and charity is very much a how many loose ends can I tie up while at the same time furthering the story? And it, Absolutely, yeah. I, 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 I always think, for example, that uh, if he had stopped at um, Spy Sinker, the, the sixth novel or the third novel of the second trilogy, I still think the reader or readers would have felt satisfied that that as a sort of denouement of the story because it brings everything back to the start, etc. Yeah. But as you say, I think um, in adding a third trilogy, it was, I think, there's probably, a, I imagine as an author, there was an itch he needed to scratch, I suppose. And by going essentially, um, going deeper and in, in, uh, into the sort of the back arc of the story of, the, uh, of all the main characters, it's a sort of, it, it, I suppose it, thinking back, it could have been a wrong step as an author, you know, to sort of try and re, uh, squeeze another three novels out of well-established uh, characters who already had a successful storyline arc, so to speak. But actually, I think, um, you know, I guess it, they, I, I, they add something. To, so like you say, when you've read to all novels from novel one, Berlin Game, through to novel nine, charity and potentially winter and in between, because it's such a, a, that's a lot of reading and B, the characters have gone through not just, you know, there there are plots and there are subplots and there are story arcs and there are overarching story arcs. Um, You do end up when you turn the last page and put the book down, you do feel that you've, um, wait, I suppose, A, you've been entertained, but also that you've, uh, you've immersed yourselves in these characters' lives across nine books, and, and it's—I guess—it's reasonably rare for an author who's who can can do that because uh, you've got to have eight great characters, you've got to have compelling writing, fascinating dialogue, you've got to have the the core ideas have got to be strong, and to do that in one book for any author is a is a triumph. But to do it over nine and then twenty or so other books is, you know, I guess that's why uh, you know. Um, during his career, he was one of the sort of, um, I guess, most uh, I suppose hardworking and well-known thriller writers in the UK. Because, uh, however, he did it, he came up, kept coming up with good ideas and was able to turn them into great books. Yeah, and I, I, I'm 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 kind of I'm taking the the break right now um, from all of his stuff, but I'm not done because like I still didn't watch the redone. I, I did, haven't watched the, the, the newer Ipcris file series. Oh, okay. I haven't watched any of the Samson uh, film slash TV series at all. So like I still have more on my, uh, on my journey, so to speak. But as far as the source material is, I'm, I'm done. And it's, you know, I, I think there are a couple books I think I'd like to reread, but like I'm in a, I'm in a place now where I'm trying to read, all of the books in my house, because if I ever move again, I want to make sure that I, I'm not lugging these things around that it's like, Oh, I'll get to it eventually. Like, no, this is, this is the journey I'm on. And so, you know, kind well, of, I'm, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to hear you say, <laughs> I'm pleased to hear you say that you have a goal of, of, of aiming to read every book in your house. I mean, I've, uh, I don't know if you can see, but I'm, I'm in my living room. I'm surrounded by maybe six, uh, yeah, about six bookcases uh, full of all sorts of books. And uh, I, I, I put a hand on heart, I can't say I've read every one of them. But I would say I have read 90% of them okay, yeah, over I'm not... my book reading lifetime. Because one thing I can't abide is an unread book. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it was the move from my apartment into my house where I went, oh, I – because in my when I had my apartment, I still left books with my parents, and like there, you just never have enough shelf space in in an apartment, um, especially in a small apartment like I had. So when I got my own house, I was like, I have, I have, I'll, I'll get, I'll buy bookcases, I'll be able to put everything on, and I just, you know, you, I moved in, and I went great, and then my parents were like, Oh, are you gonna finally take these boxes from the garage? And I was like. 
Oh, like, and so like the, the library that I have amassed over my life, I was like, oh, I, it, what, oh, okay. And so you're spending energy and time and like all the resources you can think of as far as like either storage or moving them or whatever. And I'm like, Mm. all right, I, I need to double down some of these books, you know, some of the books are handed down, you know, or, you know, gifts, but it's time. And I, uh, you know, I, I want to be proud of the books on my shelf and not have somebody come in and be like, Oh, I really like that book. And for me to be like, well, I've moved it four times, but I've never cracked the spine. Mm, Like, I just, I don't want that to be the case anymore. I, I was just thinking that, um, I, I often I often tell people when they ask me as um, when I say I'm at work and I, I'm bringing a book with me to read at lunch. Um, I tell people that I have very few vices. I I, I don't drink. Uh, I don't do drugs. Uh, you know I don't. Uh, uh, my one vice is books, and particularly most of my books are hardbacks. And over the years, as I say, I've got about six bookcases uh, in my living room, and I've now come to a point where. If I buy a new book, as I bought recently, it was a it was a, 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 a military history of Germany from from 1450 to the present day, which is quite interesting by Peter Wilson. That's by the by. The point is, it's a big, thick, 900 page hardback book, and basically, I, I, I realised I had no space on which to put it put it on my uh, bookshelf. <laughs> so, uh, what I did uh, a few weeks ago when I was on uh, a week of annual leave, I had a bit of a cull. And it's actually quite uh, when you're a sort of book collector and a book reader, you know, you sort of um, I knew I had to create a bit of space for books to come, so to speak. So um, I, I must have taken about 20 books, maybe down to the local charity shop. Um, it was a bit I thought it might be a bit harder, but actually I, it was an opportunity to each of my shelves and look at each book and take it off the shelf. If I And just really ask myself. You know, um, does it mean much? Was it a, was it an impulse purchase? Have I did I enjoy it? Read I read it? Um, could somebody else get more benefit out of it? So having I, I've sort of basically disciplined myself so that I don't in, intend to ever buy any more bookshelves. I think I've got enough. Okay. So uh, it'll have to be a sort of one in one out policy from now on. But I think it's what it does mean is that there are certain books I know I will never trade or sell. Uh, as well as my, for example, as well as my uh, Len Dayton collection, um, which looking around, I might, uh, there's two full bookcases, probably about four or 500 elements in that collection. I've got a full, um, almost complete Umberto Eco collection, as I said. I've got a complete collection, so it must be at least 100 books of the um, British humorist Spike Milligan. I've got everything he wrote. I've got a two shelves worth of books relating to the German film series High Match from the 1980s. Uh, I've got two full bookshelves of books relating to the Holy Roman Empire. So, you know, you're getting a sense that when when I find a theme or an author or a a time period, I go all in. Yeah, (laughs) I'm with you as far as the one in, one out, um, because I, I really have gotten to a point where I'm in I'm in the same boat. And it's also kind of like after I read it, um, because I, I'm, I, I'd love to say I'm, I'm at fifty percent. I don't think I've read fifty percent of my house yet. Um, it's just it, you know. But what I will say is, when I finish a book, it's do I think I'll reread it? Number one, or will I reference it in any way? Number two. And those are the only questions it's because it, it, mm. it, it's not really anything uh, with the exception of, and this is where I think you and I kind of are the same with the exception of collections, right? Like I may never read winter again, but I have a complete Len Dayton collection. I'm not going to get rid of winter. And so yeah. <laughs> there are like blood, tears and folly might have taken me the longest to read and not just because it's the longest, but it was the most dense Mm. of all of the nonfiction he did. And I I probably won't pick that one up again. Airship wreck. Meanwhile, I will probably pick up a few times because that, Mm. that was just a fun little um, jaunt through a, a specific technology period in history. But 
I own them all. I don't want to break up the collection now that it's complete. Absolutely. I mean, as I say, uh, I'm looking around again, Mike. Uh, I wouldn't say my collection is complete, but it is largely complete. I mean, I mean I'm at the stage of my collecting now. I mean, I've, from talking with a, uh, a, a book dealer I know, apparently I've, uh, uh, I've got probably one of the two or three best collections in the world based on his knowledge of, and this is a guy who is like one of the world's um, top dealers in Ian Fleming as okay. well as Dayton and stuff. So he knows all the sort of big collectors. So, I mean, and it's not, ha- that's not happened by, and I didn't have a plan, you know, when I, when I got my, <laughs> my the first book, which was instantly, I got the first book I got was, uh, I think it was about 13 or so, maybe 14. Uh, it was, um, I got the Berlin game Mexico set, London match as a box set in paperback from my father. I think it was a Christmas present. Um, when I, I, I and I read those three, I think straight one after the other, enjoyed them. Um, but at no point did I think, right at that point, I am now going to uh, in in well, twenty five years time or whatever, I will have uh, a, 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 an almost complete collection of everything Len Dayton has written. I, I mean, as a collector, I mean, I've, I'm at the stage now where um you know i'm i'm my i'm like a sort of a like a, a trophy hunter now i suppose i'm going only for ultra rare game so um what i'm on, on the hunt really rare things like there's certain ephemera to do with um you know marketing campaigns for certain books etc there are there are certain book covers that uh I've got, I've got notes about that, that, that apparently yeah, that feel apocryphal. There are things out there that I know somewhere. There's like a, uh, there's a, a marketing pack associated with a uh, billion dollar brain okay. when that was being marketed in the late sixties that I know exists, but I, I've never found an example of it. Okay. But it's like, a, I, I said to somebody recently, these, um, and I documented on my Dayton dossier uh, blog and website and on the Facebook group that, in the last couple of years, I've, I've shot a couple of white whales, so to speak, in terms of my collecting. One of which was a really obscure, and this shows that I suppose the extent of the problem I <laughs> the problem I have. It was basically a, not a book that Len wrote, but it's a, it's a very obscure. It's basically a, a, an edition of something called the Mattachine Review, uh, which is a magazine published in the '60s, the early magazines associated with homosexual rights in the U.S. Um, and I, many years ago, I read in some article or somewhere in Book Collect or something that Len had written, a, had done the front cover of this. It's just a, a black and white novel of a, a black man and a white man just in profile. Um, but I had that on my, I had that as an eBay search automatic for like 18 years. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I set it up on eBay because I, there were certain things I wanted to find. And like you do, you know, you set these things up online and you forget about them. And then uh, a couple of years ago, bing, to my inbox, eBay, you know, uh, for sale. One, And, of course, I went straight on there. I bid, you know, I, I, I got to the stage where I couldn't, having spent, um, similarly with, um, there are various, uh, um, I'm just trying to think what it was, but there, there, there are some, like, for example, there's um, there's a very, uh, for the, Paperback edition, A Funeral in Berlin, Penguin. Um, they did a really big marketing push for that with all the, the sort of uh, journalists and they took them out, all out on a plane to see the film being filmed in Berlin in 1967 uh, when, you, uh, yeah, when, the, when the paperback edition came out. And there was a, a really big, um, um, and I'd only ever seen like photographs of it, of a marketing, essentially a sort of a press pack which had, you know, some great photographs. It had all the sort of, had a specially made map. It had an author information. And again, that's something I um, I knew was out there. But again, it's just through uh, online searches, through talking to book dealers, to just keeping my eye open. And then I can't, where did I think... Uh, I think it was in a book dealer somewhere in, yeah, somewhere in, I can't remember which one, but basically it was just, he got in touch with me because he knew I was on the lookout for anything Dayton. It was pure chance, but you know, I, as soon as I bought it, I, I, I would have paid 
you know, three times what I pay for it. It was ridiculous. I'm not going to tell you what I pay for it, but it's okay. a ridiculous amount. You cannot justify what I spent on it. Um, but nevertheless, I did because I, I could, I guess. But yeah. I'm glad I did because I know that I've got it. And, and I, I don't think there are any examples I'm aware of, apart from I know that the Penguin Society in the UK, they have a copy. Yeah. I- and I think there is one copy in the Penguin Archives. But outside of that, I've never seen it in, in the wild. So there's a certain, I mean, I think it's a very male thing, but it's a certain sort of one-upmanship to know that as a collector. Um, well, there's, there's I, a completionism, <laughs> right? Like there's a completionism that's important. I, I, I mean, I, I didn't know what I, first of all, like, let's talk about naivete. I didn't know what I was getting into. Like, I was like, I really like the Ipcris file. I liked it enough to name my blog and brand after mm. Harry Palmer. And so I was like, I'll read the book. But I'm not just going to read the book. So I bought the the first Len Dayton I ever bought was the Ipcris file, but I didn't just buy the Ipcris file. I bought the Franklin Library special edition version of the Ipcris file. And so I read it and I went, all right, I really like this. I wonder if there's more. And then it just keeps going on. And one of the things about collecting books that I feel like is very different from any other kind of thing you can collect is there are little small unknown victories that happen and so i have a couple examples one i'm a big baltimore orioles fan i got earl weaver's bio- autobiography i think it was signed i bought it used because it was out of print did it say it was signed it no it didn't but it arrived and i opened it up and i went there, there's an autograph here that's cool uh an expensive place to die came with its own little packet. The the edition I got came with its own little packet of like cl- classified d- mm-hmm. packet that I I wasn't expecting. Right. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a no spoiler guy. So I didn't even go through the packet until I finished reading the book, but it was like these kind of small little victories of like, Oh, it's a first edition but I didn't realize it was a, or this comes with a little extra or it's got a autographed, like, like when you're getting an, maybe, maybe record collectors, cause those things could be signed mm-hmm. or there could be a little extra thing in the sleeve. But outside of that, like if you get a baseball card, you get a baseball card. Like there, there's no surprise of like, Ooh, one thing, uh, um, through collecting Len Dayton's works, um, I've noticed and sort of found a quite interesting aspect of it is, um, uh, as you say, the, the example you've just there that of inexpensive place to die. What you're referring to there is a sort of a, a slip, a slip case of uh, what on the face of it looked like facsimiles of um, secret NATO um, files and memos about nuclear weapons. Um, which, if you just took a quick glance at it, you'd think uh, they look authentic, but of course they're not. They're um, uh, they were ju- they're linked to some of the themes in the book, and they were give- they were presented with the first edition of the U- of the book in the UK. And of course, interesting as it's a separate uh, fold-in folder, a lot of the first editions of that book no longer have it. And so, of course, if you have one, you're probably about uh, one of the lucky few who do, because you know it's very easy for these things to get lost. And I think that's why an interesting aspect of of, of the books I've collected from Len Dayton and um, probably the same with other authors like Bond as well, is that the books themselves are, are one thing and they're, and they're always a pleasure to read. But it's also there's a sort of whole constellation of stuff around that, of ephemera, for example. I've got some really interesting examples like with Billion Dollar Brain, the third book in the Harry Palmer novels. When that was uh, the first edition came out in the UK, his publishers, to sort of, uh, as any good publisher do, would to create buzz uh, and interest in booksellers. Uh, they posted out um, in what looks like a fairly anonymous envelope marked with a Finnish postal st- postal stamp. Uh, they sent out um, a little sort of mini dossier, I suppose, of it's a little a, a facsimile of a diary of notes made by Len Dayton when he was in Finland doing research for the novel. Uh, there's a copy of a, what looks like a ticket to the opera. Um, there's a, a an airline ticket, etc. Which and it, so it gave the feeling of um, uh, almost like a sort of these are the things you need on your next spy mission, so to speak. But of course, it's the very nature of ephemeris. It's designed to be used once and thrown away. So 
th this pack, this envelope that I was just referring to, you know, again, that's something that I knew it existed, but I'd never actually seen it until uh, I think it came up for auction uh, on a book auction site, not eBay, well, good 10, 15 years ago, I think. Uh, and again, I, 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 I spent, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't need to, but I, you know, I bought it basically. I was determined to get it because it's actually quite an interesting little, uh, in and of itself, you have it with the book. It's quite an interesting little uh, insight into what sixties Finland was like, what things were like at the cold war, how an author makes notes, you know, what's interesting about this little, uh, and in, indeed a couple of times when I've, uh, a couple of times when I've met Len, that he's had, he still has it with him. He had a little, um, there are little sort of, you know, a six, uh, had i suppose a little a notebook and as an author he he's basically he's forever sort of noting things down sketching things down etc and this this is a sort of copy of some of the things he wrote down and sketched for so there's a there's a sketch of a finnish uh machine gun used by the finnish army there's a sketch of uh street lamps what they look like in holland how they you know what all this sort of minutiae of detail which you think why on earth would you write that down but but i suppose as you said right at the start is that I think particularly for Len Dayton's books is one of the things that uh, gives readers a kick is that as well as obviously the great characters and the, the storylines and the sort of, uh, and the fantastic dialogue is that the, the detail when it's used well, is really gives it an authenticity, which perhaps other, other authors might have not thought about. And I guess that's probably a, uh, it reflects, I think his character as a sort of, as a person as he's quite a sort of, uh, I guess being trained as an artist as well. He, um, He's always on the lookout for things, and rather than just forgetting about them, he scribbles them down. I should guess any good author, it's probably a good, uh, a good working, uh, working uh, way I mean, of working. I suppose. I, I think any any good human should do that. I mean, we like whether you write, whether you're a writer, a blogger, like what whether you intend to do anything with it or not. We all have those good ideas that have been lost because we mm. didn't write them down. And like I've gotten to a point now where I don't go anywhere without a pad of paper. I'm I'm much faster writing old school pen to paper than I am typing on my phone, but I will type in my phone in a pinch because um, obviously we always have that. But like you got to write that stuff down because it will just leave you. And maybe it's just something to share with your friend. And the next time you have coffee, you know, maybe it's just maybe it's the the intro for you and me for our next blog post. Like who knows what it will end up being. But mm -hmm. like, it's nice to kind of save some of that stuff because it, it does easily go like it. Just, it just so easily goes away because we all have no earthly idea why it came to us in the first place. Hmm. Um, I did. I did want to ask though, like, y you know, you got your first Dayton, and obviously you were reading other ones. Like, what what prompts you to start the dossier as it is? Because like that's a that's a jump <laughs> from like oh I like it to I want to write about it. Well, I guess um, I mean I, it's one of those things that you lose track of time. But I guess I've been a, there's been a, a Dayton dossier website uh, which I uh, I think I must have started probably at least maybe 16 years ago, and it's gone through two or three iterations through then. I think it's initially it was um, as I started collecting more and more of Len Dayton's books. I was looking for more and more information, particularly about sort of things I might have missed. And one thing I suppose, this was in a sort of maybe sort of 15, 18 years ago. And of course, the internet, is, there, there was obviously stuff out there, but it's it's not this, less much of this information than there is now. And what I suppose I found was that there were loads and loads of sites about on James Bond, for example. You know, there, even then, that the plethora of websites about James Bond. But there was no really good website or information about Len Dayton. And at that time, I guess I was you know, reading his books and started collecting some of the first editions. So I thought, you know, I suppose in that situation, I thought, well, why don't I have a go at trying it myself? So I bought the domain name. Uh, and I used it actually to learn to code um, very simple HTML or sort of website building, I suppose. Uh, and I, I, ostensibly, I, I did the website first as a sort of, I think I did it because I felt there's a little bit of, not a major injustice, but a minor injustice in the sense of where Ian Fleming has all these, and John Le Carrier had numerous websites associated with him. This author, whose books I enjoyed, there was nothing dedicated to him. Okay, and because he is, I, I think, probably out of uh, you know, he, he 
the author himself, Len, is not a great self-publicist. Indeed, he often shuns publicity. So I don't think that, yeah, he was never going to put one up for himself. So I thought I'd, uh, for, uh, at a very simple level, I took a photo, nice photograph of all my books and I put them all together and I found some, put some background information about each of the books. And I put it out there and, you know, and I've never had no expectations for it. Um, and it's 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 been there for 18 years or so. But then out of that, once, you know, certain things came, I started doing a, uh, a sort of separate blog that also called the Dayton Dossier blog. Um, again, just for just as an outlet to say when I found new, uh, when I come up uh, a real big fine as a collector, you know, it's, it's, there's an element, I suppose, if you want to show these things off, but also, um, you know, if you think if I find them interesting, other readers may find them interesting. So I did the blog and, uh, you know, again, it's never been a, a rip roaring success, but there's been a, a couple of thousand visitors each month, which is fine. And then through that, uh, as social media grew up, um, I think I started with the Facebook page first and then uh, the Twitter, as you do, the Twitter page or X page as it is now. And that's been, the mo I suppose, the most interesting evolution of, the, uh, of my uh, online presence, I guess, as a, as a collector and as a what other people have termed a Dayton expert, even though I, I, I don't put that term myself. Um, is the um, of course with social media the, the very nature of it, it is social and through that I um, you know it's the, social media has many many downsides as I'm sure you're aware but it also has like any other technology it also has plenty of good sides and the fact that it's I can have online conversations with other collectors uh, of Dayton and other works um, living in uh, Seattle uh, Buenos Aires whatever it's fascinating and it's fantastic and through uh, through the Facebook page for the Dayton dossier, uh, there are, I guess there are people I would consider friends who I've never actually met, as you do, social media friends or online friends. But there is a, there has grown up over the last 10 years, it's a nice little community of people, not many of us, but there's a, a and through that I've, uh, you know, I've met some, uh, met some really interesting people and become friends with a few of them. Uh, like uh, there's a, um, uh, Shane Whaley, who's the uh, creator of the Spyberry podcast, which I'm sure you're aware of and your readers and listeners may be aware of. We uh, got to know each other online through the Dayton Dossier Facebook. He's also a big Dayton fan, so that he got in touch with me, I think, through the website. And then we communicated uh, on and off. Uh, he lives in Vermont. Um, so every so often we'd email and communicate online. And then one day he said, oh, I'm thinking you were starting a podcast um this was uh probably seven or eight years ago now this is the genesis of spyberry uh he said do you want to become the first uh, uh guest and i thought well why not and we we'll talk about len dayton because he's a big, big len dayton fan he also likes his favorite books are the bernard sampson books as they are mine so i thought why not uh we did a podcast it was a bit rough and ready uh, this was uh, in the days when podcasts Look, were, you're, you're, you know, not you're everybody fine. had No, no you're fine. Because <laughs> I, I, I mean, I heard that podcast and I went, oh, I'm not alone. Um, because it is like the the, the reason, and I, I think it's um, something that you have by having a singular blog, because um, my, my blog is all over the place and I admit that. Mm. And that's because I, I cannot although I, I cannot commit to one hobby. <laughs> I cannot commit to one thing. I, I'm incapable of that. Um, and I, you know, as, 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 as proof that I went from blogging to podcasting and potential, I, I keep teasing video. Um, I'm incapable of one medium as well. Um, but like, I, I think that what 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 you have created is a beacon for anyone who enjoys Dayton because not only is your site the first one that comes up and it's probably the most expansive uh, version of it, um, so, and 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 I I found it more useful than I don't know why I ended up with this. I have the Dayton Companion, um, mm -hmm. which I got at some point and I was using as my bibliography for a while. Uh, but like for for Dayton, people see that and then they see that you're so you are social and they go, all right, well, I someone I can talk to. And Shane's done the same thing for sp spy stuff in general. Mm. And I, I just go, you know, it's it's exciting. Do, there's also a chip on all of our shoulders, right? Like, let's be real. Um, 
Dayton is the the he I don't know if he should be the third dog in the race, <laughs> right? I mean, with 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 the Carre and with with um Fleming, I I think the three of them um as far as classic spy stuff goes should be equal. I I don't know. Mm-hmm. I I think everyone can have their preference, but I I don't necessarily put one Hot, that much higher above the other but i think we as fans of dayton get to have a chip on our shoulder because we we are the 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 lesser <laughs> like we're, we're we're not as vocal for uh which i guess yeah fall, falls in line with the author himself we're 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 kind of like very excited to talk about any piece of it when we find out someone else is a fan and i i think yeah i think that's absolutely right i think it is the very it's the very fact that um, well, on the one hand, Ian Fleming, um, the reason that Ian Fleming and James Bond are still massively popular online and globally is, of course, that the the, the books may have stopped, but um, you know he's had a, a, a film canon <laughs> lasting almost sixty years, or just over sixty years, that's kept him in the public consciousness. Yeah. John Le Carrier uh, has is the I guess at the more literary end of spy fiction. Uh, again, he has had numerous films uh, to to uh, bring his works to new audiences. Uh, and, of course, he was writing until very late in life. I think one probably factor that maybe reflects why of the triumvirate of Le Carrier, Fleming and Dayton, Dayton maybe sits <laughs> third, which is still creditable, yeah. uh, is because after um, Violent Ward, his last full length novel um he's essentially been in retirement uh and that's probably that's at least 30 years or so uh and aside from things like the ipcrest file uh tv series which came out a few years ago and um sstb about six or seven years ago um his books have been reissued but there's no um uh it's he's essentially fallen out of favor a little bit fallen out of consciousness which is not uh, unsurprising given the fact that, like I say, he's uh, with when you've when you've produced an oeuvre of work as he has. I think you're entitled to sort of put your pen down and say, "Right, well, that's it. I'm probably done." Uh, you know, he's got uh, two sons. He's got lots of grandchildren. He's been in retirement for thirty years. Fine. I mean, that's great. But of course, it does mean that uh, um, in terms of the public consciousness, there's. But now, of course, I mean, I think one what's an interesting thing I've often think about is at the moment he's uh, he just he turned ninety four earlier on this year, so inevitably at some point in the next one would hope not too soon, but you know uh, he will join Le Carre and the the great author's library in the sky, so to speak. Um, and at that point, you know that, that I, I guess that probably brings to an end the sort of golden era of um, of spy fiction, and also, on a sort of, I think, on a personal level, it's as, as somebody who's enjoyed his work and and, and communicates it. I'm very fortunate now, actually, through the website, to be able in a position where um, I, I keep in touch with him irregularly by email. It's very, and he's he's a very interesting man to chat with. I mean, we I had an email with him a few weeks ago. Uh, he asked me, he asked, he asked me, what what are your opinions on Bismarck? <laughs> I guess because he'd read something about it or whatever. Um, but uh, when he does uh, uh, eventually shuffle off this mortal coil, um, you know, I think it'll, it'll mark the end of that period in British fiction when there were big beasts roaming around, you know. And, of course, this was uh, – here's in Le Carrier and John, Ian Fleming's real sort of – their their great periods were a sort of pre-internet age where, you know, books were – I think people bought books and you consumed books – in a very different way as people read now. Um, yeah, I'd go, I'd go one step further. I think that they're also pre-internet age in terms of writing about the Cold War in a way yeah. where it was still forefront. I mean, like, they're writing about the Cold War before the wall falls, mm-hmm. which means they're writing about spy fiction in a way that, like, I mean, and look at the new James Bonds, look at the new Mission Impossibles. They all have their cell phones. They're all, they all have a guy, a hacker in the chair, like, doing stuff. Their heyday for all three of them was 
talk, two guys talking on a bench, two guys having coffee, two guys in a car physically going to scout the thing. There was no spy satellite. There was no cell phone. And so I think that there, there is also a different pace to mm. the things that they wrote. And it's, it's refreshing almost. Well, of course, uh, in Dayton's books, as well as, as you say, the Carrier and Fleming, and indeed most great Cold War fiction written at the time, it was uh, it was analog rather than digital. But also, of course, it if, it's very easy to forget these day, these days with the Cold War being over thirty years old, uh, thirty years ago. But um, I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember as a child being uh, you know the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and stuff, a child teenager. Um, it was a very different world, and the threat of you know global nuclear destruction was very real, particularly in somewhere like around 1983, when Berlin Game came out. You know, everything on the nightly news would have been about what was going on in Berlin, uh, what was going on in Poland with solidarity, etc. These things were uh, very potent, and these were real, real threats which shaped popular consciousness and the news agenda and culture in a way. Uh, and as you say, I think that I guess it's probably one of the things that I enjoy about Dayton's books is uh, that well, the characters, because as you say, the, the world of espionage back then in real, uh, in reality and in fiction was human centric. It was a human, human intelligence. It was all about relationships. And uh, that's why I think uh, the Bernard Sampson novels, uh, I think, are my favorite because Ultimately, it is a story about relationships and also about a story of betrayal in relationships, not least because, uh, without giving uh, spoilers away, but one of the main characters' uh, wife uh, betrays him, uh, let's put it in multiple ways. Uh, this is Bernard Sampson, the main character, his wife, Fiona. I mean, it's... it's it's a, so it's a, it's a story about relationships and it's a story about organizations. I think that's the other thing about, uh, I think Dayton's books is the, because as somebody who's spent uh, his whole life working in various different offices and, and it's part of it as a civil servant, um, the sort of characters like Dickie Croyer, who's, who's Bernard Sampson's uh, boss ostensibly in the, the game set and match series, they're, written so well that you recognize that there are people in every walk of life who are, you know, arrogant fools, uh, who are dilettantes, who are um, always looking for the next rung up the ladder sort of thing. And I think one of the reasons why, <laughs> why I uh, enjoyed um, in the Bernard Sampson books is because while Bernard is obviously a, 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 a spy, he's also, he's not no longer at the top of his game and he's also having to confront the sort of a, uh, interminable bureaucracy and uh, uh, that, that most of us find in our work from time to time. So there's a sort of, um, and that doesn't happen by accident. That's a combination of having really good plots, really well-wrought characters and a supporting cast that are there, not just because to support the main actor, but to interact with him and to fill him out as a character, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, I think the main thing, and I think every time I reread them, is that Len Dayton's books are of their time, and that's a good thing. I think not necessarily a bad thing, but it just reflects that they were written in the sixties, seventies, eighties, and early uh, and early nineties. Um, so they are. I mean, nowadays, of course, they're a, they're a, they're a almost <laughs> coming to the point of nostalgia for me. You know, the, when you're reading about people uh, going down into, um, I mean. Uh, Every time I read uh, Berlin Game, and there is a, there are in the office or the department where Bernard Sampson works, is the place called the Yellow Submarine, which is a, 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 a subterranean uh, office or library, a computer library underneath the Foreign Office, where uh, all the files on the various Soviet agents, including Eric Stinnis, his uh, yeah. adversary in the books, um, they're all kept on you know, things like microfiche and. Uh, floppy disks and uh, reel to reel disks you know it's uh because nowadays we've got uh with all of us carrying around supercomputers in our pockets it's very difficult to forget that um while technology has always been a part of the spy game you know that at times it's uh, the technology has been quite rudimentary um as you say things like dead drops 
um, leaving a sort of a, a coded message under a stone or a certain part bench, etc. You did that because there's no, there was no other way to get a secret message to do somebody behind the Iron Curtain, you know. Um, so it, it can feel a little quaint. But equally, you know, it's um, it just reflects the fact that the, uh, that was the world in which uh, the characters that he wrote about uh, existed. And I think one of the reasons why, even though, of course, uh, unlike Ian Fleming, Dayton was never uh, anything to do with the spy world at all. Um, it's written to a degree where you, you, you get the impression or at least the feeling that he must have known something. Yeah, yeah. But of course he didn't. He, he, well, I think he was in the 60s and 70s. It was um, as a, certainly as he got more uh, famous and more uh, wealthy, he was able to connect with more interesting people. Um, he is like a sponge, I suppose, in the terms of he, um, he met – he met some really interesting people. He met some really nefarious people in Soho in the sixties. Um, he will have, uh, you know, he, he, he will have had, uh, people around his dinner table in the sixties, uh, all walks of life, including from, uh, you know, government and espionage, etc. He, uh, in, you know, various magazine articles and various interviews he's given and stuff. He's, he's, uh, He's been behind behind Iron Curtain many times. He's talked to Nazi uh, generals. He's talked to uh, KGB agents. He, he's uh, he's had some, obviously met some fascinating people, and I guess all these things are screwed away in the back of the author's mind, and they end up in characters, like I guess any good author does. He uses what every relationship, every meeting he has is there's a kernel of something there for a future character. There are aspects of reading and collecting that just make them wonderful pursuits. But I think we need to remove the stigma of being late to the party and that it's somehow a bad thing. We all probably come late, as Rob and I discussed to authors, but it's not limited to that. Because of the amount of books published, movies released, series available. And while with books it seems more accepting to come late to the party, we need to normalize not being up on all of it. It's impossible for someone, even with no job and all the time in the world, to be completely up on everything. And so we get there when we get there, and those around us should be happy we've arrived at all. It's no small thing to say you've made a new friend. But because of our respective blogs, Rob and I have become friends. Our online communities overlap, and we're supportive of each other. We've arrived. And when we arrived wasn't in junior high or elementary school. It's whenever we arrived. This is the good of the internet. This is what it can do when it's not just about making sales or just about getting clicks. So while it appears that neither Rob nor I can abide an unread book, which means we have our own work cut out for us, we do have plenty of suggestions for you on each of our sites and appearances on other podcast episodes. And speaking of, do check out Spybrary with Shane Whaley if you enjoyed this conversation, because there's probably something over there you'll enjoy just as much. And you'll not just find Rob over there, you may even find my voice on occasion. So I'll leave you with this one question. Who is your favorite spy? Thanks for listening to The Palmer Files, episode 107. And now, for the official business. The Palmer Files releases every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you're still listening, I encourage you to join the discussion. You can find all related ways to contact myself and my guest, Rob Mallows, in the show notes. There, you can find a link to Rob's website, DaytonDossier.net. Again, that's D-E-I-G-H-T-O-N-D-O-S-S-I-E-R.net. For all of your Len Dayton, Bernard Sampson, and Harry Palmer needs. The music for this episode was provided by Heno Heiter. Email can be sent to this show at thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. And remember, your home for all things Agent Palmer is agentpalmer.com.
All right, Rob, do you have one final question for me? I guess it's quite a simple question. Is is there a book that you've never got to finish? You've started and you thought at some point, oh, you know, I'm going to have to t- put this down. So the, the, there isn't, but that's because I will torture myself. Like I, I've met people that are like, I, I didn't like the book. I put it down. I'm, I'm done. Or like I read four paragraphs and I wasn't into it and I, I could put it down. I'm, I'm not that way. I, I don't, I've, I, I, people talk about hate watching shows. Hmm. I will hate read to finish a book. If I opened it up, I'm going to finish it. Um, and so those take a lot longer to read, but yeah. I, I, I'm sure they're even in the things that like, I didn't like that I was reading, um, like specifically the one, um, that comes to mind is there was a book, look, I, I don't think it's any shock that I, I consider myself like a nerd or a geek. Um, I, I, and it's a badge of, it's always been a badge of honor to me. Like I've never seen the derogatory. I understand the derogatory mm. side, but I don't understand. I don't take it that way. There was a, one of these, um, books. I don't, re- I re- I wish I could remember the title now and I reviewed it and basically it was written by a popular student. <laughs> like it was written by somebody who has never been marginalized in their entire life talking, trying to understand what it was like to be a nerd and a geek. And I'm like, you're not the person to write this. Like you just don't understand. Like mm-hmm. you're making observations that don't exist for anybody who was ever called that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a kid or, or a young adult. And so I think I threw the book across my room at one point I was so frustrated <laughs> but I had to finish it because I was like is there a redeeming mm. quality in this and that that's kind of one of the reasons why I don't put things down no there was not anything redeeming in it at all but it was like I <laughs> but I did finish it well I'm glad to hear that because I, I'm just I was I mean, in asking a question I was trying to think of is there a book I uh, I've ever put down and I None this brings to mind. I know there was you know, a classic book. I certainly think it took me a, a very long time to read and probably in stages was Lord of the Rings. I mean, I probably had that book as a, uh, as a teenager, you know, probably over a period, maybe about a year, a year and a half or so, you know, I read it in small chunks, but uh, I, I do agree with you in the sense of, I think whatever the book is, whoever the author is, if they've taken the time and the trouble to speak, you know, write something. I think, um, if not for any reason other than as a courtesy to them, I think it deserves. Uh, I guess if a book is really turgid, I think it's probably legitimate to put it down. But if, if um, you know, I think it deserves a good, a good crack at it. And I think as a reader, you owe the author that. And I was just thinking, there's one. What's actually turned out to be one of my favourite books in the end. Um, it's a book called The Kindly Ones by a French author called Jonathan Lettel. And when I say you it's a sort of 1,100 pages thick, it is literally 1,100 pages thick. It is like a brick. And it's a very tense, intense, dense uh, novel about the experiences of an SS officer in the Eastern Front. And it, it only has 1,100 pages, It's 11, but it only has three chapters. So it's not set up for easy reading. And that's a book that I've probably got about maybe 150 pages in and then stopped. Um, and I, for some reason, I think it sort of languished on my shelf. And then eventually I, I, there was a part of me felt, you know, I'm almost like an, an affront that I couldn't finish this book. And of course, the uh, um, one I did eventually, I think probably, I, I found a reason to pick it up again off my shelf and, you know, I stuck with it and, and, of course, it's, uh, the, the, the moral of the story is if you stick with things, kids, they eventually can often, you know, pay, the pay dirt is there because you get to the end of this novel and like no other novel I've ever written, you know, you, you had a sense that you had gone through this experience and it's a terrible, there's, there are no redeeming features in this ca- the main character's life, but the storytelling is fantastic and the arc of the story is yeah. and it's made, But the, you really feel, my goodness, I have read a book. The closest thing I've got to that is um, I read The Magus by Jonathan Fowles and 
I think the fir- through the first third of the book, I was thoroughly lost. I'm mm. like, I have n- what, like, just like it, it. almost felt like we were boxing, and I just could not stand on my two feet. I just kept getting yeah. hit, and I was woozy. And then, like, <laughs> by about the halfway mark, it's just for some reason started to click. And by yeah. the end of it, I loved it. But like, it's. And so unlike that other book that I hated all the way through, like this one had an arc where I was like, I'm still, I've no, what, like, just look, uh, why, what's going Like, I, uh, like I would put the book down after reading a, a chapter and be like, what, why, what just happened? But like, <laughs> you just, you, sometimes you just have to trust the process. Perseverance, uh, often pays off i think as a as a reader of anything uh i think you have to be um uh, if you pick up a book and start it as i say i think you know unless you're very unlucky there's always something you can get out of a book even yes. if it's just a sense of satisfaction knowing you read plowed through something that was pretty turgid at least you at least you did it you know <laughs> yeah 